the guideline for online teaching and learning and we'll also be touching a little bit on alternative assessment. Now before we begin, allow me just to read off some very important housekeeping announcements so that our webinar today goes smoothly. Just to let you know uh, that this session is recorded by ADEC. So kindly please do not click on the record button on your own computer. We will share the recorded session with everyone after the webinar. We will also be sharing the slides after the webinar. Uh, hopefully after you uh, return to us the uh, feedback form for the webinar, we would like to really request assistance to do that. And we'd also like to request to please mute your microphone during the webinar. If you have a question to ask, unmute your mic and ask a question and then mute again after you're finished. You can also post your questions in the Q&A chat box on the right hand side of your screen. If you think of the questions for the speakers at any point, um, you can just type it in there and we will, we will address it either during the webinar or towards the end of the webinar where we have our Q&A slot. I trust that it's all all right. Um, before I begin, could I kindly request if everyone could turn on your cameras just for a little while so that we can just see each other. It's a little bit uncomfortable just looking at names. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Prof. Wen, Sharina, Prof. Fun, thank you. Uh, I see a few others also about to turn on their mic, so thank you. Chit <laughs> Yohannes, thanks a lot. Okay, thank you so much for letting me know that there's actually souls over there. So without further ado, uh, it's my pleasure now. We will begin with today's special webinar on online teaching and learning guidelines. So just give me several moments to share my screen. And okay, I hope that you're able to see my screen now. If for whatever reason um, it's not coming out, can someone kindly just shout out and let me know? Uh, Mira? Yes? Uh, can you put on the slide uh, the presentation mode? Um, okay, I am actually clicking on the slides, but. Uh, do you see the slides yet? Uh, we are seeing the, it's gone now. Okay, do you see the slides now? Yes, we see the slides. All right, thank you so much. Everybody, that is Che Umu, Umu Satya from uh, ADAC. She's the producer for this webinar. So thank you so much, Umu, for assisting me with that. <laughs> okay, so here are our slides. Uh, I trust everything is okay, Umu, I can continue. Um, yes, you may. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, as mentioned earlier on, uh, we're going to be looking at today on some of the guidelines that UM has actually um, has actually presented for all of us to follow for this coming semester. Well, this semester it's already started yesterday for this semester's online teaching and learning, and we'll also be touching uh, on the alternative assessments that we're supposed to do for this semester. So, um, so, okay, sorry about that. I think I just clicked the wrong thing, okay. So, uh, as you may already be aware, this week, the entire week from Monday until Friday, we are actually holding this uh, special webinar to share with the UM community on uh, some of the guidelines and the things that we should be doing, the good practices, and also the things that UM is expecting us to do with our online teaching and learning this semester. And we'll be looking at uh, alternative assessments and I'll be touching on that as well. And just to let you know that uh, if anyone needs help with your online teaching, uh, particularly with your e-learning matters, we will be holding a series of clinics uh, at ADAC uh, on the 9th of October, the 23rd and the 30th of October. So you can try and uh, register for these clinics. It's, these are actually one-on-one -on -one clinics. 
where our e-learning experts will be guiding you one-on-one -on, -one, uh, on Spectrum, Microsoft 365, Turnitin, and uh, related e-learning matters. So this has already been announced and I'm just uh, sharing it again for your benefit in case you have not heard about it yet. Okay. And um, another thing that I'd like to request is at the end of this special webinar, if you could please kindly fill in our feedback form. The link to the feedback form will be available, I believe, in the, in the chat or the Q&A. So you can click on it and please let us know what we need to, um, what are the other things that you may want to know about that we didn't get to cover yet. So we really, really appreciate and look forward to your feedback on that. So now let's get on right to business on the online teaching and learning guideline. As you may be aware, UM has issued a guideline for all of us to follow for this coming semester or for this current semester on online teaching and learning. And this guideline is available at these two links. It's available at the UM academic website. That is the website or web page for the Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic and International Matters. And the, gu the guideline is also available at the ADEC website. If you go to ADEC website, just go to the section on UM Teach Online, and in there you will see numerous guidelines and other resources that are useful for helping us uh, with our teaching and learning. Now, this particular guideline, um, it's actually a collaboration uh, between several PTJs uh, under the Deputy Vice Chancellor's um, portfolio, uh, ADEC, as well as QMAC, um, AASC, uh, and I think several others as well, uh, and uh, most especially ASP uh, Center, have contributed to this online teaching and learning guideline. So it's very much a collaborative effort. And the guideline covers the design of online teaching and learning, the delivery of online teaching and learning, as well as assessment or what we call alternative assessment. So there are, of course, um, these three aspects if, uh, of online teaching and learning. When we talk about the design of online teaching and learning, we're really talking about outcome-based education and constructive alignment between the uh, program and course um, learning outcomes and the uh, activities and assessments that we conduct throughout the semester. Um, it is also related to how we design our delivery and our activities and our assessment in accordance with the updated student learning time, the SLT, which has to be slightly changed due to our online teaching um, and learning as well as the design of our curriculum in terms of the course workload and the activities that are conducted during the class. And it also covers um, the delivery of our classes synchronously and asynchronously. Asynchronous referring to classes that are conducted not at the same time, but classes that are conducted where students uh, do their own work uh, self-paced work and lectures are available for consultation but we're not actually conducting class at uh, the time where everybody is you know joining the class at the same time and I'll be touching on this a bit later on as well and in terms of delivery we're also looking at um, the social presence the teaching presence and the cognitive presence that we need to have in the online teaching and learning environment. So this actually is very, very important, particularly for online teaching and learning, because um, as we all know, as we've experienced um, for nine weeks during semester one of uh, the last session from March until June, July, um, teaching online is quite different from teaching face to face in the classroom. And it's very important that we're able to help students to actually experience the social presence of their classmates, of their peers, and the social presence of us as teachers in the classroom to interact with them. It's also very, very important, perhaps even more important, that we establish our teaching or teacher presence um, through the online teaching and learning environment. Meaning that while we conduct online classes, it means that our presence are actually felt. We may upload things online, we may share things online on Spectrum, 
but the students need to hear some explanation. Um, they need to hear, um, they need to, students generally want to have this notion that their lecturer is part of the class and delivering um, or assisting or giving them consultation on the things that we have posted in our spectrum pages. And of course, there is the cognitive presence, which is very much the learning and the content of the course. And we'll be touching on this a bit later on. <clears throat> and of course, finally, a very, very important aspect of online teaching and learning is the um, assessments that we do. And in this presentation, we'll be looking at formative assessment, which generally um, what we tend to consider as continuous assessment. Uh, and we'll be looking at summative assessment, which generally we use to consider as the final examination. But we'll be doing the formative or continuous assessment as, and summative assessment slightly differently as we did last semester. And we'll be doing it as alternative assessments. And we'll be looking at that um, in this presentation. But first, let's go to the design of our online teaching and learning. So, of course, when it comes to constructive alignment, we're all aware that our program and our course learning outcomes are very much um, what we need to deliver and what we need to help students to achieve in our courses. So just as an example here, this is an example of a course learning outcome where students um, in this course, we can assume that this might be a um, um, a traffic management or a uh, transportation course. So we can assume that the CLO for this course is for students to apply the theory of air traffic management to develop solutions for practical air traffic management problems. So this is what we expect the students to do at the end of the course. And we're all familiar with this. We all have our CLOs, about three of them, hopefully, for our, for our respective courses and classes. So the CLO, of course, needs to be constructively aligned with um, what activities students are doing in order to learn, in order to master this CLO. What are the learning activities that we provide for students to help them achieve this particular learning outcome? So as an example, for students to be able to um, develop solutions for air traffic management using air traffic management theory, perhaps some of the learning activities, uh, besides just us maybe lecturing and explaining about it, some of the learning activities that students can do to achieve this learning outcome can be computer-based simulations. It can be um, group work. It can be perhaps um, a project that they come up with to pitch to um, uh, to pitch solutions for air traffic management, and that is the learning activities, the things that students do to learn about air traffic management solutions and theories. Now, uh, the third part of constructive alignment is, of course, the assessment and the feedback that we give to the student on their learning. So the assessment basically is how we know whether or not students are learning what they need to learn, how we know whether students are achieving or able to achieve um, the learning outcome, the CLO, the course learning outcome. So this is, of course, done uh, very often through continuous assessment that we often do in our normal classes before the MCO started, <clears throat> sometimes through um, the final examination. But just as, as an example, for this particular CLO, the assessment that's given to students is that they have to come up with a laboratory report. And this particular laboratory report is probably part of their continuous assessment. And the marks allocated for the particular lab laboratory report is 20%. So I'm actually mentioning about continuous assessment now. But as we go uh, forward with the other slide, I'll actually be looking into um, formative assessments, which can be done throughout the semester, but not necessarily we're going to use all of the formative assessments to actually give marks to students. We may use some of it as continuous assessments to give students their continuous assessments marks, but we may also be using formative assessments <coughs> which I'll explain about, which is basically assessment that helps students to learn, not just assessment in which we um, 
judge or evaluate uh, their achievement and their performance. So with a formative assessment, it's very important that we also provide students with feedback in order for them to know how they're doing. So we'll look into this in several more slides. But before we go into that, uh, just let me share this uh, uh, screenshot of the um, BR3 Borantiga or the Form 3 or the uh, Alignment of Learning Outcomes to Assessment. Penyelarasan Hasil Pembelajaran Kepada Kaedah Penilaian. So thank you QMEC for coming up with this form and sharing it with us and allowing us to use it for this particular webinar. So as we can see here, uh, this is just our normal form. You know, we have our CLO, uh, we have the PLO, the program learning outcomes that the CLO is mapped to. We have our uh, learning strategies or strategy pembelajaran, and we have our assessment methods. And finally, we have the criteria uh, for, achieving, for achievement of course learning outcome. So very important to highlight is that in our online teaching and learning, the CLO should remain the same as it was previously in previous years and previous semesters before we switch to online, to 100% or full online teaching and learning. The CLO should, um, there should be no changes to it, basically. If there needs to be changes, then uh, this will be something that you'll have to take all the way up to, if I'm not mistaken, to the Senate for approval. But now that the semester has started, uh, and in general, we don't recommend that, um, we don't recommend changes to the CLO, so we really, really need to stick to the same CLOs. What we might need to change, however, in the Borantika, or form number three, BR3, is the learning strategies, strategy pembelajaran, what the students are doing um, in order to learn this particular CLO. And we also need to make some changes to the method of assessment, um, how we're going to assess students' achievement of this particular CLO. So for the method of assessment, uh, just allow me to highlight that, as we all know, the continuous assessment weightage has already been um, been set previously, and the continuous assessment weightage, as well as the final examination weightage, should not be changed. The weightage must remain the same. However, the type of assessment that's conducted for continuous assessment and the type of assessment conducted for final examination can and should be changed in order to fit the online teaching and learning environment. And this is where we will be touching on or we'll be using alternative assessments. Now, before I continue on into alternative assessments, just allow me to um, share a very, very important reminder. It's very important for our KPIs and also for our faculty KPIs and for the universities reporting to the Ministry of Education, uh, the Ministry of Higher Education, that we need to ensure that our spectrum pages, our courses in spectrum, are blended. And that means that it's important for us to ensure that we share at least eight resources in Spectrum. Now, these uh, at least three activities in Spectrum and at least two assessments in Spectrum. Now, remember that Spectrum is our online learning platform. It is possible, and I know that some of us, including me myself, have used other platforms during the MCO in order to deliver our teaching and learning. Um, during the um, online teaching and learning period. But whatever that we do outside of Spectrum, uh, it's very important that we ensure that we meet these minimum requirements for our Spectrum course to be considered as blended. Now, the issue is that it's difficult for us to do the reporting for other modes or other platforms that we use outside of Spectrum. We can still use those, uh, provided we don't overburden the students with so many different apps or so many different um, types of uh, platforms that they need to download. Um, but if we do use several, for example, maybe uh, Microsoft Teams or Google Meet, we need to ensure that we record, um, we document it and put it into Spectrum, whatever learning resources, activities and assessments. So in terms of resources, you know, we can share uh, PDF files, we can share URL links, we can upload videos, and these will be counted as resources. We need to upload minimum of eight into 
for activities, we can actually also, um, uh, things that are counted as activities in Spectrum would include things like uh, forum discussions, the forum, wiki, um, we have a feedback that we can use in Spectrum, so many other activities as well. So these will be counted as activities and we need to have a minimum of three in Spectrum. And for assessments, we need to have a minimum of two. Assessments in Spectrum, um, those uh, applications that are considered as assessments would be um, the Spectrum quiz, uh, the assignment, which I think many of us are using, Turnitin assignment, is also considered as assessment and if any of us are using workshop uh, that is also considered and counted as assessment and we need just to have two assessments uploaded into spectrum and to ensure that our course is um, given the blended status okay. now allow me to go back again to the issue of um, delivery and design of our online teaching and learning by looking at the student learning time or SLT. Now it's important that uh, we update our SLT form or the BR4 Borang Empat form. This is student learning time form and uh, we need to reflect how we're actually spending or allocating the SLT based on our online teaching and learning which will now be different from what it was last year where we actually conducted you know physical classes with some blended learning components in it now it's important during this particular online uh, tnl period that we could actually allocate a higher percentage of slt for students self-learning these are the things that they do um, basically the the work that they need to do in order to be able to follow our classes do our assignments and achieve the learning outcomes the study that they do on their own and it's also important for us to um, allow for extra time for non face-to-face -face activities to ensure that the CLOs are achieved now previously we had quite a lot of face-to-face -face activities uh, or face-to-face -face time with students because we would have class every week we meet with them every week uh, and we met physically but now that we're not able to do that physically uh, we need to consider allocating extra time for students in order that they can complete their assignments because as we all know it's a new normal and our students although for our second third year students this will be perhaps you know um, not their first time doing classes online but for our first year students, this might be the first time that they're doing um, online classes, particularly in a university environment. And uh, we need to also consider that students are not in class, they're not in school, they're not at the university on campus. Many of them will be at home and at home they could have all sorts of you know uh, situations that we're not aware of they may have to share laptops with siblings they might have to um be studying in a very noisy environment so it takes a little bit more focus and time for them to actually complete some of their activities and even students that are actually here on campus that are staying at our um our our uh, residential colleges some of them may actually not have their own laptops so they actually need to come to the faculty to use or they may even need to book the uh, computer uh, in the computer labs in order to do that so we need to consider these things when we are designing the SLT uh, for this particular semester now as mentioned earlier on all changes um, excuse me <coughs> sorry as mentioned earlier on, um, all changes to the SLT needs to be reflected and updated in our SLT BR4 form. Uh, and this is actually done to assist, to ensure that at least 70 to 80% of the activities that we planned, we actually conduct. So to know more about this, you can read on page two in the online teaching and learning guideline. <clears throat> but I will explain a little bit more about it as well. So this is actually taken uh, from the from an appendix uh, that you will be able to find in the online teaching and learning guideline. So how do we estimate uh, student learning time uh, when we're doing 100% uh, uh, online learning or e-learning or even actually later on when we go on to blended learning when we have activities that are done 
online, we can actually look at this particular uh, appendix for a guideline on how to calculate or how to allocate the SLT for students. So if we have live interaction, uh, synchronous live video conferencing class or interaction with students, <clears throat> we can consider that if we are allocating, say, one hour for this face-to-face -face interaction. Student preparation time generally needs to be um, the same or perhaps doubled. And if we're doing really complex topics where students need to read up or students need to go back and check their notes after our lecture, this might take uh, three hours. So we just multiply that by one or um, two or three hours. So generally, for whatever activities that we do conduct, during um, the online teaching and learning for any kind of activities that we conduct basically as face-to-face -face teaching and learning or as non-face-to-face -face teaching, anything that we deliver to students or that we ask students to do, we should allocate double that time <clears throat> for students to actually prepare what they're doing, for students to actually basically do the preparation work, do the homework um, for this particular activity that we are recommending for them to do. So for the next one, if we're doing, say, a collaborative learning activity, if we have allocated one hour for that as our non-face-to-face -face TNL, for the student preparation time, we should multiply that by, uh, say, one or two hours. So if one hour uh, non-face-to-face -face collaborative learning where students probably are going into their groups and doing group work, for their individual student preparation time, we should allocate minimum one hour or double it to say about two hours. Um, similarly, if we have uploaded, say, notes or presentations, uh, PowerPoint slides for students to view on their own, preferably if we're doing that, we should upload PowerPoint slides that are narrated, where we actually um, record our voice narrating and explaining the PowerPoint slide as we would during a lecture in class so that students are not just looking at a PowerPoint slide and then trying to, you know, um, interpret it for themselves. So it's good if we can actually upload narrated PowerPoint slides. So we can basically um, consider that, let's say we have around 18 or 20 slides. So that would probably take around one and a half hours for students to view uh, and, you know, go back and view again. Uh, that is the time that they're doing the non-face-to-face -face, um, activity, but we also might want to give time for students in terms of their preparation time, and we can then allocate in our borang uh, but uh, an extra, we can allocate one or two hours, double that time, uh, or a slightly equal to that time for student preparation time. And the same thing goes as well for other activities such as media-based activities, um, text content for students to read. Uh, we can determine how long it takes for a student um, or even for us to read and double that time um, for the student because we tend to read faster because we are more proficient with the material. We're more uh, proficient with, you know, what what the material is actually saying. We know more about it, but students don't. They're just learning. So they do need like a little extra time, more time than we do in order to read. Uh, if we're giving instructional activities, uh, say group discussions, forum, uh, anything like that, if that instructional activity takes maybe one hour for the student to complete, then we should also allocate one or two hours uh, preparation time. Uh, and you can read the rest here. Similarly, for all other types of activities that we're conducting. Um, now this, let me just highlight that this is a rough example and a rough guideline for how we would allocate um, time for student preparation for the different activities, the different learning activities that we provide for them. And of course, with the different learning activities, we have face-to-face -face activities, which would be activities that we conduct synchronously live, where all students and all lect all students and the lecturer gather at the scheduled class time. We gather online and we do activities. Um, maybe we're doing a lecture, maybe we're doing uh, an in-class um, discussion. So that's happening synchronously and we can consider that as 
face to face, where, as you can see here, is defined as when the learner and instructor, or when the students, our class, and us are physically or virtually present at the same time on the same platform. And that is when we're doing our synchronous face to face teaching and learning. Whereas when we have students do things on their own um, outside of that scheduled class time or when we're doing it maybe even in that scheduled class time, but we're allowing students the flexibility of when they want to do it. This non face to face learning is learning that takes place without the presence um, of the instructor at that time and on that platform at the same time. But and we consider this as non synchronous learning, but at the same time, uh, just to highlight again, even with a non face to face non synchronous learning, it's important that students can still feel the teaching present. And for this, perhaps we can allocate um, consultation hours where students can, you know, uh, book a consultation slot with us or we can be uh, non synchronously available for students um, to chat with. Uh, we can do that, for example, via WhatsApp groups uh, where students can ask their questions. They don't understand something and we can answer, but we don't have to answer right then and there. We can answer maybe a couple hours later or later in the day. So do take a look at this uh, particular uh, guideline for estimating student learning time. It's um, on it's in appendix one of the online teaching and learning guideline. And now allow me to go on to share a little bit about what I was mentioning earlier on that we don't quite know what students are experiencing when they're doing their online teaching and learning. So this is a really wonderful example. Um, that Associate Professor Dr. Faradina has actually uh, shared and, 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 um, and we're, we're sharing it here where we're looking at the course workload of a typical student. Okay, we often think that, you know, as lecturers, we're so busy, we have so much to do. We have our teaching, we have our research, we have our supervision and our publication and our administrative work to do. Uh, sometimes we forget that students are also very, very busy. And one of the uh, complaints that students had uh, during the MCO when we had our online teaching and learning last semester was that they had so some students were complaining that they had too many assignments, way more assignments than they had during their normal face to face classes in previous semesters. That's understandable. It was our first time doing online teaching and learning and many of us uh, were struggling trying to figure out how to do it. And one of the easiest way was to upload materials on Spectrum and give students activities and assignments for them to do so that we know that they're actually doing the learning and the studying. But assignments and activities also take time. So just looking at this particular student's course workload, this is an imaginary student, but you know, this student is, um, if we can take a look at it, they're taking five courses, uh, 18 credits. Some of our students are taking 20, uh, some may even be taking up to 21, 22 credits. Um, so their, their, their schedule is pretty full. So you can look here that with a simple average 18 credit um, and five courses, students workload or the students class schedule time is pretty full. And you can see here, you know, the busiest days of the week, they're basically busy pretty much um, every day. Even here on Monday, you can see like a two hour break, but you know, two hours for lunch and prayers and getting ready for the next class, time just passes by. And um, if you look at this, you know, what time the class starts in the morning? What time does it end in the afternoon? So I wonder then when will our student have the time to start working on their assignments? When will they have the time to do the pre reading or pre videos that we ask them to watch um, before the class? And when will they have time to you know, finish all of this as well as be prepared for their own classes the next day. And keep in mind that some students are also working part time. Some students now during MCO at home might also be assisting their parents with looking after younger siblings. Uh, and if they are in a red zone and schools are closed, they might even be assisting their younger siblings with the younger siblings online um, 
online schooling. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the environment at home, we don't know how conducive it is. So we need to be compassionate and consider whenever we're giving out assignments, how much time um, does the student really have? So we need to give them assignments, obviously, for them to learn, but we need to consider whether or not it's too heavy. And so in accordance with that as well, uh, we would know that in students are not taking just our class, but they're taking other classes and other subjects as well. So with that, it would be very good if uh, all the lecturers in the same program perhaps can, um, can get together and can sort of like uh, decide when each course or when each lecture would be giving our um, deadlines for submissions or maybe quiz or tests so that it doesn't overlap with other lecturers too much because we don't want students say in week um, 10 to suddenly have five deadlines for like uh, 3,000 word essays that they have to submit. We try, if possible, it would be really good for us to maybe deal, um, discuss with our our colleagues who are teaching the same program so that we can try and space out the deadlines and assignments, quizzes, um, or whatever other assessments that we give to students throughout the 14 weeks. Um, and this is also mentioned in the online teaching and learning guideline. So um, with regards to the cross workload, uh, please ensure that, you know, how many assignments and tasks and that we give to the students, that the number of assignments and tasks and the complexity of the assignments and tasks should commensurate with the course credit and the student learning time. If it's like a three, if it's, if it's a two credit course, maybe not that many tasks and assignments. If it's a three credit course or a four credit course, perhaps you can have several more, maybe three, um, uh, you know, uh, or four assignments, but look at the complexity of the assignments and also look at the uh, due dates for those assignments so that it's not all um, compacted towards one particular week where students have to submit uh, assignments for so many lectures um, or so many courses in one particular week. Okay. So that's basically about the um, design, how we plan, how we design uh, our online teaching and learning. Now let's look at some of the uh, issues of delivery. So as mentioned just now, we will be doing uh, synchronous teaching as well as asynchronous teaching. So with synchronous teaching, uh, basically this is live teaching, real-time teaching when, um, you know, we're, we're with the students on the same platform, everybody is there, and this has to follow the scheduled time that we've been given so that we don't take up another lecture or another another courses, another subject's time. So with synchronous teaching, it happens in real time, uh, and we are encouraged to do synchronous teaching or live online teaching at least three times in the semester at least at the beginning of the semester the middle of the semester and sometime towards the end of the semester you know towards a uh, week um uh, i don't want to say what week but possibly you know towards the end like maybe week 12 13 14 um towards the end of the semester so this is where we conduct our live classes we can also invite guest lecturers um from overseas to also join our classes and give a guest lecture. And if we do this, this also helps with um, our internationalization KPI. And if we get to do a guest lecture for um, a colleague's class in another country or another university, that also helps with our KPI for networking and internationalization. So this is actually an amazingly good time. It's a great time for us to actually connect with our peers, with our colleagues, um, and network with people from other countries and other universities because everybody virtually is conducting online classes um, around the world. So with the synchronous teaching, this is what we can do. I'll touch more a little bit about that. But before that, let's look at asynchronous teaching. So asynchronous teaching happens not in real time. Um, where, for example, I gave just now, we could ask students to uh, read something uh, or watch a video, and they do that on their own time, not at a specific time that we set, not during the scheduled class time. 
So what we should be doing is that we need to have asynchronous teaching for every week. So each week, perhaps as a guideline, we could upload one learning um, activity. We could upload learning materials, something to read, something to watch. Uh, we can upload a learning activity, something for students to do, and a learning um, assessment, something for students to do where they, where they and we can gauge whether or not they understand or are mastering the material and the topic for that particular week. And other things that we can do for asynchronous learning is we can pre-record our lectures. We can do screencasting. Uh, screencasting is basically when we record whatever is on our screen and uh, we post that, we upload that as a video uh, on Spectrum for students to watch later. So that's kind of like together with pre-recording our lectures. Uh, and this is really, really good if we need to actually show students how to do something on screen. For example, maybe um, I think accountancy uh, could use screencasting where you probably need to show students, um, you know, different uh, formulas or columns. Um, other subjects as well, if you need to actually show students how to do something, perhaps um, I probably shouldn't be talking about uh, other other subjects that I'm not familiar with. But for example, if I was to be uh, teaching students um, how to say uh, how to um, how to reference APA style, then screencasting would be very useful so that I can actually show examples and show students what an APA style uh, reference um, looks like. Um, so pre-recorded lectures, screencasting, slide casting, narrated slides, as I suggested earlier, when we have a PowerPoint slide and we actually record our voice um, explaining each slide, that can also be very useful. And other asynchronous methods that we can use is that we can actually also take advantage of MOOCs, massive online, massive open online courses that are available. Uh, on Coursera, on FutureLearn, on Open Learning. So many of these courses um, are available. Some of them are free. Uh, some of them, you know, probably students probably have to pay in order to join the courses. So don't don't choose those. But we can ask our students to go and take a look at one topic in a MOOC, for example, and then come back to us or perhaps they can uh, write a reflection or they can answer a quiz or uh, do a little uh, question and answer or do a discussion uh, in Spectrum Forum on the particular MOOC, on the particular topic that they learned in a MOOC class. So there are various, various ways that we can actually do to conduct our asynchronous um, teaching and learning. It's not just uploading things for students to read, not just uploading our PowerPoint slides. Um, asynchronous teaching and learning is actually a very powerful way that helps students to actually learn at their own pace. Um, but of course, as mentioned earlier on, we need to have our teaching presence and ensure that students can still contact us. Uh, if we don't want to do a WhatsApp group, you know, it can be quite intrusive. Uh, we can actually have a uh, chat in Spectrum, or we can have um, emailing groups, or you can also have, uh, say, a special forum in Spectrum that's just for students to ask you questions uh, and to consult with you, and then you can actually explain things that they're asking in there. So that teaching presence is very, very important uh, because otherwise, you know, students are just getting things without any structure, without any explanation from us, who's actually supposed to be the lecturer. Okay. So um, now going back to synchronous or live online teaching. Now, as mentioned here, we should have at least three synchronous classes in the semester. Now, this is actually something that's a guideline. Having three is the minimum. That's very important. Uh, hopefully, definitely, I think the first class definitely needs to be a synchronous online class. You can use Google Meets or you can use uh, MS Teams as we're doing right now. Now, if you, it's actually up to the lecturers uh, whether you want to have more than three synchronous live online classes during this 14 weeks. You can if you want to, if you feel that it's important that you need to have that synchronous live class. Um, 
you know, more than three times. But if you do feel that you need to have it more than three times, it's very important that you consider many factors, including um, to what extent it's, you know, uh, students, especially your B40 students, your undergraduate students, your students who are overseas, uh, who are actually on different time zones from us, to what extent those students would be able to cope with 14 weeks or 10 weeks of live classes. So for example, our class might be at 2 p.m. Malaysia time, but we may have students um, in another part of the world for whom when it's 2 p.m. for us, it's actually maybe 12 a.m. for that student. So we want to consider as well our students' well-being, whether or not we want them to be staying up every week um, just to join our live synchronous class. If we can actually deliver the same material and do the same activities asynchronously, then perhaps we might want to consider doing that class, um, you know, asynchronously uh, for most of the semester and just keep to the minimum three live classes or maybe four um, at the most. But if you have students that they are mainly here in Kuala Lumpur or, you know, in Malaysia, that there's no issue with the time, perhaps for your master students classes, I think master students tend to have a better connectivity. Um, they are not so much an, in the B40 group as our undergrad students. And if you feel that it's important to have online discussions together at the same time, live at the same time, then perhaps it's more suitable for your master's class and you can actually run live synchronous class um, more often for your master's students. So this is something that you know each one of us can actually consider and think about. And it would also be good to, um, to actually include your students in the decision making of how many live synchronous classes you would want to run. And you may also want to include your students or at least get their feedback on the platform that you want to use to run the live synchronous classes. For example, if you have students in China, it might be difficult for them if we run classes using Google Meets uh, because of the uh, China internet firewall. So perhaps they may have other suggestions um, that you might need to take into consideration. If you have students that are possibly in very remote areas where they have very bad connectivity, you know, it's like sometimes on, sometimes not, um, things are slow, the bandwidth is very low, for example. Uh, perhaps for them, if you have students like this in your class, you may want to limit the synchronous class to just three times in the semester. And, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. And you may want to consider actually um, running this class not necessarily on Google or Google Meet. You could also have a synchronous class via chat or via discussion uh, forum on Spectrum. Or what I actually did was I actually had a synchronous class using Telegram because uh, last semester I had students that were actually in uh, very remote areas. But of course, if you're using a platform that is not the official platform, which is Spectrum, Google Meets and MS Teams, then you may want, you definitely have to get your students permission and agreement to use a different platform. If even one student is not able to use a different platform, then please don't use it because we don't want to leave any students behind. We want to ensure that all our students actually get to join all of our classes and all our activities. <clears throat> okay, so now let's go and look into assessment. So. Uh, before we get into sort of like, you know, uh, the nitty gritty of alternative assessment, particularly for our online teaching and learning, let's think about why we conduct assessment. Okay, so for students, we conduct assessments so that they will know how well they're doing in the learning process. For us as lecturers, um, as instructors or teachers, Assessments are important in order for us to kind of like gauge how well we are actually delivering our content or explaining a topic um, to students. And it helps us to reflect on our teaching, our delivery, and also to reflect on how we've designed the class and perhaps improve our own teaching practices. <clears throat> and for our program, uh, or department or faculty. The assessment is very important because um, just as it helps us as teachers to refine our teaching, it also helps 
the department and the program to refine and improve on the curriculum. So very important, very useful for curriculum review, which we have to do every three years, but it's always useful, you know, um, every year or every semester, we take a look at uh, how students are doing and kind of like that is notes that we can keep for when we are about to do the curriculum review, when the curriculum review season comes around. So now, uh, now this is probably possibly a uh, very, very most important part that I think many of us are quite uh, wondering or quite um, unsure about. So this is um, on the assessment. So what you see here on the screen is three types of assessment, formative assessment, summative assessment, and alternative assessment. Now, generally in UM, we are used to the term continuous assessment, and we're used to the term final examination. Um, either your class is 100% continuous assessment, where all of the students' marks or grades is taken from numerous assessments continuously uh, that, that are conducted uh, between week one to week 14, or you have a blend of, or you have um, some continuous assessment, perhaps 60% of the marks are taken from continuous assessment, and another 40% of the marks are taken from the final examination. So what we're looking at here is actually formative assessment, which is kind of uh, what we should be doing for continuous assessment. So whenever I'm talking about formative assessment um, from this slide onwards, I am talking in part about continuous assessment, but I'm also talking in part about other kinds of assessment, assessment for learning in which we don't take marks or we don't give marks to the students. And when we are uh, referring to summative assessment uh, or final assessment, this is actually the assessment that we are using as an alternative to the final examination. And um, what we should be doing during our online teaching and learning is looking at alternative assessments for the continuous assessment and alternative assessments for the final examination. So I'll be getting into that um, a little bit uh, more deeply after this. Okay. So let's just take a look at the difference between formative assessment versus summative assessment. So remember now that when we say formative assessment, we're talking about the assessment that we conduct uh, throughout the semester. And when we talk about summative assessment, we're talking about assessment that like the final assessment that we conduct towards the end or at the end of the semester. Okay, so let's look at the two differences. Formative assessment occurs before or during instruction, before or during the teaching that, we, that we're doing. Summative assessment occurs after instruction, after we're done teaching. Okay. Formative assessment, uh, if we go you know, um, by, by strict definition, formative assessment is assessment that is conducted to help students learn. It's assessment for learning. It's assessment so that the students, when they do the assessment, they can get feedback and then they can know how well they're doing and they can improve um, on their learning. Whereas summative assessment is assessment of the learning. It's the evaluation or the judgment of how well the student has learned or achieved the CLO, the course learning outcome. Summative assessment is actually assessment where we should be giving students feedback. We should be giving students descriptive, meaningful feedback, explaining to them what their mistakes are or how they can do better, or even praising them on what they have done well so that they can continue doing well in that particular area or so that they know that they've actually done very well in a particular um, topic or on a particular um, issue that we're teaching. So that's descriptive feedback that we give for assessment that's uh, formative, assessment for learning. Whereas for summative assessment, 
we're actually giving students an evaluation. We give them a mark, a grade that tells them how well they have done for this particular course. And it happens at the end um, of the of the course or at the end of the teaching where students are basically just being evaluated and given a grade on their performance. Now, formative assessment can be informal and it can also be formal. And some examples of formative assessment can be quizzes throughout the semester, observations that students do and write about, exit tickets, uh, you know, uh, which is informal. It happens at the end of the semester, but it's an informal formative assessment to sort of like give us an overview of what how students feel about their learning. Um, writings, essays, drawings, interviews, um, uh, all sorts of things that students are doing throughout the semester that can be considered as formative, as helping them to learn and helping us to also gauge how well they're learning so that we can help them improve further um, in their learning. So that's formative assessment. Whereas summative assessment happens at the end of the semester, happens usually at the end uh, after we've taught um, all the topics. And, you know, uh, of course, national, international exams um, for some of for some of your programs, we have professional board exams. These are all considered to be summative assessments, things that basically students are given a mark or a grade on at the end of their learning. So it's the reason that formative assessment is very important is because it is an opportunity for students to get feedback. Uh, on their learning, which they can use as feed forward for improvement, how they can improve while they are still studying, while they are still learning within the 14 semesters. Whereas with summative assessment, the feedback is kind of like backwards. It's a feeding backward on how well the student has achieved, how well they have actually performed. And summative assessment, usually it's an assessment where once a student gets the grade or the mark, there is nothing more that we can do as teachers to help them improve or fix that mark or fix their learning if they don't understand something. It's something where once a student gets a C at the end of the semester, that's basically it. You know, they cannot improve further. That's the mark that's going to go on their transcript. Whereas with formative assessment, this is actually what we can do continuously throughout the semester. And we can, uh, as, as, as I mentioned earlier on, we're used to the term continuous assessment. And we do actually use marks that we give throughout the semester for assignments, for quizzes, uh, maybe for participation, a task that we give to students, and we actually give them marks on that. But with these marks, these marks are actually tend to be smaller. You know, they should be like, you know, uh, maybe for one quiz, it might be 10 10%. Maybe if I give marks to students for participation in a discussion, maybe I might just give 5% of the marks. So that these are very small marks. And if we can actually give students feedback on their continuous assessment throughout the semester, what they can do is they can look at their marks and maybe for the next assessment they can improve it. That is if we're actually giving marks for that particular continuous um, or formative assessment. We can also do formative assessment where we don't give marks to students, uh, where we can just give them feedback so that they can improve, so that when we do have an assessment that comes with marks for it, students are more prepared for that particular assessment and hopefully they can actually um, do better. Uh, so before I get into that, just l uh, allow me uh, my apologies. I actually ended up pressing this uh, slide. Just let me get back to that slide just now. Okay, here we are back to that slide just now. So just allow me to share uh, what I do for formative and continuous assessment um, during my class. So what I have done, for example, is um, I did not participate fully in formative. Uh, in, sorry, let me just rephrase that. Um, my way of conducting formative assessment, um, I've done it in two ways where the formative assessment helps students to improve their marks for their continuous assessment marks. One way that I've done it is by having an assignment for students where the assignment, for example, maybe it's an essay or maybe it's an article that they have to write or they have to enter a competition or writing competition. The assignment might be worth, say, 25 
marks or 25 percent. But instead of having the students submit the assignment to me, say in week 10, and then I grade them and I give them that 25 percent, what I do um, between say week two and week nine is that I actually have three different submission deadlines for students. So they have to submit to me their work in progress, maybe their outline, maybe just some ideas for what they're going to write about, uh, perhaps in week three or week four. And um, when they submit that, I give them feedback on how to improve. So to ensure and make to make sure that the students actually submit, I have like tiny little marks for submission, maybe just maybe um, five marks um, for them to five marks if they actually meet their deadline to do their first submission of their work in progress. So I give them um, I give them feedback and hopefully they can improve. And then they have another deadline, maybe submission number two, perhaps in week six, where they again submit work in progress. Hopefully they've actually improved on the comments and the feedback that I've given to them during their first submission. And then I give them more feedback. And then they have another submission, perhaps submission three, another five marks or two marks, and however marks that I want to give just for submission um, on the deadline. So during submission three, I give them more uh, comments. Now they have a bigger, like now they have done more work. Maybe submission one was just an outline. Submission two was a rough draft. Submission three is like a final draft. Uh, it's like a full draft, but not the final draft. And I give comments and help them to improve. And then uh, after that, perhaps, then they will submit one more time for me to give them more comments. Or if not, then it is their final deadline for submission four, where it's the final submission where they give to me um, their, their essay or their writing. And then I give them a mark, uh, 25 marks or 20 marks for that particular piece of work. So what I've done here is that I have actually taken a uh, continuous assessment so that it's actually done throughout the semester and I give students feedback um, you know, on their work so that they can improve. So that's one example of how we can do a formative assessment uh, during our, for our continuous assessment for the students. Another thing that uh, we can also do is for example, maybe we can have a set of uh, mini, 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 mini quizzes for every topic that we teach. So, uh, or mini, mini tasks that students have to do. So let's say that perhaps I may have for every lecture or every topic that I give to students, perhaps I have eight topics or 10 topics in one semester. So for every topic, there will be a little assessment at the end of the topic. Now, perhaps I may have 10 topics. So for each topic, I might have, say, um, a little quiz or a little activity for students to do. And for each topic, each activity is worth five points. So topic one, five points, topic two, five points, and all the way up to topic, say, 10, five points. So altogether, that's 50 points um, or 50 marks. But, you know, I already have taken 25 marks for my assignment, for that essay assignment just now. So I don't need 50 marks. Um, let's just say that my, my continuous assessment is 50% uh, and my final examination or my final assessment, my summative assessment is 50%. So for the continuous assessment, for that 50%, I've already taken 25% for the student essay or writing assignment that I described just now. So I have another 25% marks that I need to give to students. And I have uh, I have 10 topics and for each topic I have um, quizzes for each topic. Now what I can do is I can allow students to actually take 10 quizzes or do 10 tasks, one for each topic, and they will get um, pseudo marks or pretend marks for each of those 10 topics. But instead of counting all of the marks, I take the top um, five marks. So I, I take the top five assessments and I and I only record those marks so that students uh, can actually get the best marks um, for their continuous assessment. So I take maybe perhaps uh, if a student say for 10 quizzes, a student gets maybe um, three marks 
three marks, five marks, five marks and four marks. So I just take the top five um, that they actually achieved. This is another way that we can do formative feedback um, as a continuous assessment. But of course, if you do that, it's very important that you have to ensure that um, if you're only taking marks from some assessments, you have to ensure that those marks are actually taken for the same CLO uh, and not for different CLO. So that's very, very important as well to ensure that students actually achieve that particular CLO. So that's just an example, uh, two examples of how we can do formative um, assessment for continuous assessment. Okay, now um, let me explain a little bit about alternative assessment. Um, so basically, as I mentioned earlier on, is that now because we're doing online teaching and learning, and it's not face-to-face, -face, we're actually needing to ensure that the kind of assessments that we give to our students commensurate with the um, student learning time, with the activities that we have them to do, with the topics that we're teaching, and also um, we need to consider and be quite, you know, um, vigilant, or not vigilant, but mindful of the challenges that students might be facing learning on their own at home without coming gathering together um, in the lecture hall or in the classroom. Just as we are as teachers and as, as, as you know, uh, instructors and lecturers, just as we are struggling and, and finding it a little bit uncomfortable teaching to a screen uh, virtually, like right now, as you know, I am looking simply at my screen and I have no idea uh, and I have no feedback from you. I don't see your faces. So it's the same thing, you know, you experience that as well when you're teaching in class. So just as we are uncomfortable, uh, students may also have similar challenges um, in learning online. So that's why it's important that the assessments that we give is actually something, uh, the kind of assessments that we design and that we give to our students actually helps them to learn online and actually also um, fairly evaluates their learning if we're doing summative assessment. So alternative assessment is actually um, a form of assessment that's also sometimes known as authentic assessment or comprehensive assessment. Some people call it holistic assessment, uh, whatever it is. It's just a type of assessment that we do that is useful and helpful for the students to learn and uh, reliable for us to evaluate and judge their learning. So we can use alternative assessment for both our um, formative continuous assessment as well as for our summative final assessment in replacement of the usual final examination that we used to have. Okay. So basically alternative assessment, it refers to all sorts of assessments that are used to measure the student's ability and proficiency in performing complex tasks that are related to the intended learning outcomes. And that's where um, designing good assessments, designing assessments that are constructively aligned to the course learning outcomes is very, very important. Now, ADEC has actually uh, produced a book on um, alternative assessment. It's called Redesigning Assessment for Holistic Learning. It's a quick guide for higher education. You can access this book on this particular URL or you can go to the ADEC website and look under uh, UM Teach Online and under Guidelines and Resources. So this particular book offers, you know, um, dozens of examples and ideas of how other people or how some of you actually <coughs> excuse me again some of you actually are contributors to um to this book as well so if you need ideas on how to conduct alternative assessment if you need some some ideas on what kind of assignments or what kind of assessments you can give to your students um you can go to this book and you can just take a look at what other people are doing and hopefully that might give us some inspiration or ideas for our own classes. <clears throat> okay, now let's talk a little bit about um, comparing traditional versus alternative um, assessment. Now, traditional assessment is what we have been doing a lot of uh, up until last um, first semester of 2019-2020 uh, and then after that you know for semester two we had to basically come become really creative and figure out how to give alternative assessments but now uh, I think all of us 
both us individually as lecturers as well as the university as a whole and um, higher education collectively, globally, are now a little bit more experienced with what we can do for alternative assessments. So some examples um, of alternative assessments, uh, as you know, I mentioned early on, you can find in the book um, that ADEC has produced. But if you want to compare traditional and alternative assessments, usually we can think of traditional assessments as usually being one shot, one off kind of like assignments or tests. And they tend to be um, in, co in comparison to alternative assessments, which tend to be uh, more continuous, longitudinal assessments that allow students more time to improve. Um, very useful for formative assessments. Uh, for traditional assessments, you know, usually the tests are indirect and um, inauthentic. Inauthentic meaning that the tests usually are not tests that look at actual real world um, applications or real world um, um, uh, context. Whereas with alternative assessment, uh, we have the opportunity to, to give students authentic um, contextualized um, assignments or tasks that they can do so that they can relate what they're learning to the real world or they can relate what they're learning to what they would actually be, um, you know, what they actually see out there uh, that people are doing in industry, in government, um, or in their field um, of study and, or, or in the working field that they're studying about. Um, for alternative assessments, we can consider group projects. Uh, traditionally, there we do a lot of individual projects, but I do know that we also do quite a lot of um, group projects uh, for traditional assessment. I'm going to talk a little bit about group projects um, a little bit later on. Basically, there are some complaints of students uh, about the difficulty of doing uh, group projects um, during online teaching and learning, so I'll address that shortly. But just to continue on with this list of comparing traditional versus alternative assessment, um, as mentioned earlier on with traditional assessment, we tend to give delayed feedback to learners in the, ter in ter in the sense that we don't give them feedback, we just give them a mark at the end of it, uh, at the end of the assessment. Whereas with alternative assessment, particularly with the uh, formative continuous assessment, we are actually um, giving feedback or we're supposed to, we have the opportunity to give feedback to our students and they have the opportunity to improve on their marks um, after that. With traditional assessments, exams are usually you know, set at a particular time and place and students all gather there and they have to complete the exams in two hours or in one and a half hours for everybody at the same time. For alternative assessments, um, exams can be flexible, flexibly timed in the sense that we can give students take home exams. We can uh, give students exams where we actually give them questions, authentic complex questions that they can answer um, at their own time and that they can submit to us maybe 24 hours or 48 hours later. So there's a lot more flexibility in the kinds of um, you know exams that we give to students. Just to highlight, um, we are not encouraged, but we are discouraged uh, for this online TNL period. We're discouraged to give students um, final examinations. Um, I'll talk a bit more about that, but just keep in mind that we really need to think about alternative assessments to give to students, alternatives to the usual final exam, like the usual two hour exams um, that we do at the end of the semester. We need to try and avoid that and give students alternative assessments um, for the end of the semester. Okay, I'll get back to that later, but again, let me go back to um, traditional versus alternative assessments. Uh, the the tests uh, or the tasks that are given for traditional assessments, as I said just now, many are inauthentic uh, and they're decontextualized. Similarly, um, uh, you know, with inauthentic assess uh, assignments and tasks. For alternative assessment, just as we encourage authentic assessments that relate to real world, uh, we also uh, al we also want to give students assessments or assignments that are contextualized, that are in context to what the real world uh, is or to what their own specific um, experiences are, what their authentic experience in real life is. 
So we make the assessment more meaningful to the student, making it more concrete as opposed to giving them decontextualized, inauthentic kind of tests that are kind of removed from their own authentic experience and from the context the context of real world applications or use of that particular knowledge. And uh, we often give uh, non-reference score interpretations for traditional assessments, whereas for alternative assessments, um, we tend to give criteria and reference score interpretation, kind of like rubrics that students can look at uh, before the, the assessments so that they know how they're actually being marked or being graded or being assessed. And with traditional assessments, um, standardized tests um, that perhaps, you know, our students have actually taken for their STPM or A levels before coming in here uh, versus classroom based uh, tests that we tend to um, tend to uh, uh, we tend to um, we tend to want to give to students um, in alternative assessments. Okay. Now, uh, I apologize. I realize that I'm kind of like overshooting uh, the time a little bit. I will try to go a little bit faster. If you need to leave, don't worry about that. If you have questions to ask, you can post your question uh, in the Q&A forum and I will answer it. And uh, we will actually also have um, this recording available online so you can check it out later and check out um, the answers or the responses to your questions. Okay. So these are just some dimensions of alternative assessment. Um, we can do self-assessment, peer assessment, group-based assessment, portfolio-based assessment, or performance-based assessment. And this is covered in the book that I mentioned earlier on. Um, I won't go through uh, so much on what each of these different assessments are, but you know these are things that we can consider and there are examples in that book that we can look at on the kind of self-assessments, uh, peer assessments, performance-based and group-based, as well as portfolio-based assessments that we can give to our students. Okay. Now, um, very importantly, uh, let me just cover on the course information for current semester um, or uh, what we need to add or what we need to actually um, alter uh, in this particular form. So again, thank you to QMAC for sharing this form. So as mentioned earlier on, we cannot change the CLOs in uh, our forms and we cannot change uh, the weightage of the continuous assessment and we cannot change the weightage of the final assessment uh, or the final examination. That has to remain the same. Okay, But what we do need to do is to look at the assessment that we're giving for continuous assessments and we can update those in our forms and we can uh, key in or we can not not key in sorry we can update those assessments and provide uh, or mention the specific percentage of that assessment so very important to note whatever that we have given in here okay so for example if it's 10 percent for a class test 10 percent for an online quiz um, and 20 percent for assignment or 20 percent for a video presentation do not change this we need to give this to the students at the beginning of the semester and we need to stick to these uh, percentages and we need to stick to these kinds of assessments that we have already declared and that we've already announced to students at the beginning of the semester we can have other formative assessments that are not graded that are not marked to help students improve and learn uh, we can add that in as long as it's not too heavy and doesn't overburden the student but don't give marks for anything or don't uh, require students to have to do other assessments that are not that are marked but not um, declared in this form so please be very vigilant about that. So um, similarly for our final assessment or our final summative uh, assessment, which is the alternative that we need to do for the final examination, we're not encouraged to give a final examination. And one of the reasons for this is uh, because it's, uh, you know, um, we want students to be able to do their summative assessment in a way that is not the normal final examination because um, we don't want to be doing that online. We don't want to be doing, you know, so many exams online where there would be issues of uh, network overload or there would be issues of students maybe having uh, problems with 
bandwidth uh, wherever they are, perhaps it's difficult for them to submit uh, or do an online exam because their connectivity is not very good. So we want to avoid that. So what we need to do, however, is we need to have um, assessments at the end of the semester that covers all of the CLOs uh, that we provide as a summative assessment. And it doesn't have to be one final assessment. It can be a series or it can be not too many though, perhaps two will be the, the maximum, where we actually allow students to do their assessment um, at their own time with a deadline towards the end of the semester. Now we can do this um, at any time when we have covered all the CLOs. If we have finished covering all our CLOs, say by week um, 12 or week 13, we can actually conduct the summative assessment in week 13 or week 14, and students can submit it during that time or a little bit later. And we can also allow students to submit their final assessment, uh, for example, the case study or take home exam during the three weeks after week 14. Okay, um, that is usually the final examination week, but instead of conducting a sit down two hour final examination, we can give students a deadline perhaps um, that's during that three weeks as well. So it's very flexible whenever we want to do the summative assessment. It can be at the end of the semester after we've covered all the CLOs or it can be during the um, final examination week which is not the final examination, but the final assessment or final summative um, assessment, final assessment week. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> sorry about that. Okay. Uh, just to highlight a little bit about online assessment. Okay. Uh, as mentioned earlier on, you know, we have our formative continuous assessment. We have our summative final assessment, and we should be doing both the formative and the summative assessment as alternative assessments. So for formative or continuous assessment, uh, we have to ensure, as mentioned earlier, that the weightage for each continuous assessment and final examination, or which what we would like to call final assessment, we have to ensure that the weightage follows the approved weightage in Borang Lima in Form 5. Um, and uh, I think we should not be changing it, but we will really, really have to then, of course, it has to go through the proper approval processes that goes all the way up to Senate. Um, that's for the formative continuous assessment. Um, same thing goes for the summative assessment. The weightage must remain the, sh must remain the same and not changed. Uh, as mentioned earlier, it can be done at any time towards the end of the semester once we have finished covering all of our course learning outcomes for that particular subject or that particular course. And we should be replacing the final examination with al alternative assessments. Now, very important thing to note is that although we are not giving students a final examination paper, but any kind of assessment, um, summative assessment, okay, let me just go back to this slide, any kind of assessment that we're doing under the weightage of final examination, the summative final assessment, needs to be vetted the same way that our final examination papers are vetted in previous um, years and previous semesters. So the case study report, the take home exam in this example, needs to be vetted by the um, vetting committee at your department or in your program. And that process of vetting has to be done the same way that we did our vetting for our final examination. And of course, um, all of the assessments done for the final assessment, um, for the replacement for the final examination, all the different types of assessments, for example, the case study report or the take home exam, all of these must be constructively aligned to the CLO that we had in previous semesters aligned to the final examination. So you can get more information about this in the online teaching and learning guideline that's available um, on this link as well as um, on the ADEC website. And there are also more resources on the ADEC website. Just look under UM Teach Online. So um, with that, this ends um, the webinar. Um, please 
Uh, remember to provide your feedback for this webinar. The feedback link is available in the uh, Q&A chat, um, chat box. And um, if you have any questions, I realize that it's five o'clock. If you have any questions, I will actually be looking at the, um, I'll be looking at the, the link, uh, sorry, the, the chat box and see if there are any questions that I can answer later on. But um, in the meantime, I think perhaps if anyone wants to ask a question, you can um, kindly do so. If anybody needs to leave, um, this recording will be available for you later. So I will, uh, I see uh, Chit Johannes has her hand up. So maybe I'll just go straight to Chit Johannes. Do you have a, a question? Mute. Mute. Okay. Uh, I can hear you now. Okay. All right. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes. Uh, well, thank you for the clarity of the alternative assessment. Uh, just one question. Uh, the difference between <clears throat> the formative and the summative assessment. Uh, the summative assessment can be done. If I remember one of the slides, uh, it can be done at the end of a topic or a section. Perhaps. So if you or or even LO. Correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, well actually, um, for the summative assessment, uh, the university is advising that uh, it should only be done after all of the CLOs have been covered. Uh, I know that there are, there are different definitions of summative assessment, uh, and maybe in some other places, the definition says that once you cover one CLO, you can actually conduct a summative assessment for it, but uh, presently at UM, because we're doing the summative assessment as a replacement for the final exam, which used to cover, which basically our final exams used to cover, you know, overall, uh, the course overall. So our summative assessments would also need to be done after we have covered um, the entire course or, or all of the, uh, the learning outcomes. Okay, all right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, Prof. Sharifa Zamia has a question. Uh, you may. Hi, Salaikum. Alaikum Salam. Hi, Dr. Amira. Thank you so much for sharing with us. It's a lot of um, new knowledge, added knowledge. I just want to ask regarding um, synchronized learning. Um, before the MCO, I find it that flipped classroom actually works a lot. It, it, it works for me and my students, and I'm having difficulty to do flipped classroom, you know, uh, with an online mode. Is there any tips or anything that you think that would work? If okay. I to do, yeah. All right, there are uh, many resources online, especially, and uh, I would actually uh, also recommend if you want to um, Google somebody named Prof Karim. Uh, he does uh, a lot of videos and, and, and things uh, about Flip Classroom. But um, just offhand, I think what we can do for Flip Classroom is, um, of course, you know, giving the materials wouldn't be a problem because that's what we were doing before this. So it's not so much giving the materials online and having students actually do the studying before they enter class but the the challenge might be how to actually run the class uh, where you're actually having discussion with students and looking at students work rather than giving a, a lecture so there are possibilities of doing this um, through uh, online learning where you can maybe have small groups, maybe you can have a schedule during class time, just some groups, uh, maybe one or, one or two groups where you focus on that group of students and actually give them your feedback. Another way could be that you can have students um, submit to you or send to you their questions or their work in progress, and then you can actually uh, do the explanation or feedback or sort of like consultation. Uh, you can do it by recording yourself or you can do it during a live class where you are looking at work that students have already shared with you prior to the class and then sort of like giving explanation um, and discussing it during the class. It can be challenging, uh, but I think it's definitely doable. But thank you so much, um, Dr. Sharifa, for asking the question and maybe inspiring all of us to think about doing flipped classroom. Okay, so um, any other questions? If not, I will go through the forum. Okay, um, so let me just start with uh, the very top. Um, 
allow me to take a bit of time to scroll down. Okay, so um, we have a question here on uh, is there a guide on how we can get a guest lecturer to do either synchronous or asynchronous session? Need to consider some people are not on MS Teams. Okay, um, in terms of getting a guest lecturer to do a to do an asynchronous session is, uh, I think, probably uh, not much of a problem. You can actually just have um, a guest lecturer, uh, you know, record something and upload it. But I think it's more fun for the students when they actually have a live interaction with a guest lecturer. So what we can do with getting people onto um, MS Teams is that you can actually advise the guest lecturer to sign up for a free Microsoft Teams account using their their personal email, their, their usual email. And then afterwards, you can actually add them into your class Teams on MS Teams. So there is a, there is a way to do that. Uh, and I think there are also some guides. Uh, definitely, we can find guides online. But I believe there are also some guides um, available um, um, on, on various websites as well. And I think UM SITS had also shared uh, a guide on this. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you can check out the um, the Telegram group, uh, I think, that they have. Uh, and apart from that, you could also sign up for our e-learning clinic and maybe get some guidance from um, our e-learning experts um, on how to do that. Okay, so let me go on to the next question. Uh, what are the three official platforms? Okay, the three official platforms are Spectrum. Uh, that's our official learning management system. Um, the other two are official platforms for doing synchronized live online um, classes. And that is Google Meets using your um, UM, uh, your UM email account and also Microsoft Teams that we're using right now. So those are the three official platforms. Um, thank you, Prof. Dr. Eunice, for helping to answer that Spectrum is one of our uh, official platforms. Uh, yes, my apologies. I think I, I I kind of got confused about the time. I thought it was a two-hour session that ends at 5.30, but uh, yes, I realized now it's supposed to end at 4.30. My apologies for that. Um, okay, so I've got a question here on um, formative assessment. Okay. What is your opinion on some department stands that the mini assessments of five to ten mark each burdens the student? Okay, so this is something that uh, I think each department or each program probably needs to come to a consensus too. Now, for me myself, uh, I actually practice this mini assessments of five marks each. Um, and I have designed it so that it literally takes a student no more than 10 minutes to complete one assessment that is about five marks each. Um, for the student that you know that that's actually quite um, that for the student that really understands what the topic is, they can actually complete my five mark mini assessment in less than five minutes. So that's one way that I ensure that um, it doesn't burden the student. So as mentioned earlier on, the marks that we give to the student, the tasks that we give to the student, they have to be align they have to commensurate you know if you're going to give the student uh, a task that takes them maybe five hours to do maybe an essay that essay really cannot be five marks it should be a lot more than that uh, but if you give a student a mini task like maybe they just have to upload uh, maybe just have to write something in a discussion forum and that takes maybe just 15 minutes to do maybe that can be um five marks um so it has to actually uh, commensurate with, you know, the amount of workload that we're giving to the student um, and the amount of marks that we're giving for that particular task. OK, so the next question. Um, yes, we have a comment here that it's quite hard to give lump sum 30 marks without breaking into smaller marks. Most, most definitely. And if you're giving students an assignment or a project, you know, a project could be worth 30 marks. But obviously, we need to actually break down the marks and we can use rubrics for that. Um, in, or say, 
formatting, uh, maybe 15 marks for their argument, maybe say 10 marks for their examples. So definitely, uh, if we're giving like really high marks, we need to break that down. Okay, um, for the next question um, uh, from Dr. Rosida uh, at Faculty of Medicine. Okay, for authentic assessment, is it acceptable to reveal the assessment at the start of the semester as it will be a group-based one? For example, in which students will be required to produce an infographic on a topic, they only need to submit in week 14. Let's say it will be worth 30 marks. Students will be receiving feedback throughout. Um, I'm just, and this is my, my personal opinion, um, I, I don't speak for everybody, but for my personal opinion, I think it is acceptable to reveal at the start of the semester, and it's probably useful to reveal at the start of the semester um, to students, you know, what assessment they have, even if we don't actually assign that assessment until later in the semester, but it doesn't hurt to reveal early on so that students are at least mentally prepared. Um, they, they're, not, they're not given a shock, like suddenly in week eight, we say, oh, you have a 30% mark assessment that's due in, uh, in three weeks time, in week 11, kind of like shocks them. So it's good to actually let them know early on in the semester, what are the assessments and how much marks are given and when the assessments uh, will be due or when the assessments will start. So definitely, for example, if you're doing an infographic assessment, um, even if the students cannot start on the assessment yet at the beginning of the semester because they don't have the knowledge or you haven't covered the topic yet, but at least students can start researching um, how to do an infographic. They can start looking at examples of infographics so that when they actually start that particular assessment later in the semester, they can focus more on the content and not worry about how I'm trying to figure out, oh my God, how am I going to do an infographic and kind of like, you know, um, get a shock on that. So yes, definitely. Um, my personal view is I would recommend um, letting students know early on in the semester what the assessments are. Okay. So um, another question um, regarding Dr. Lila's question. Dr. Lila earlier asked a question on whether or not uh, it's burdensome to students to give them many mini assessments worth five marks or ten marks each. So regarding this question, would the lecture, would it would be the lecture responsibility to make sure that all the assessment done must be within the allocated SLT? Very true. If it's within the SLT, then it won't burden them. Also very true if we've designed the SLT um, well. However, the, the SLT must really reflect time spent for the assessment. For example, if you ask a student to write a four-page report, then the SLT should be more than a preparation for a 10-minute quiz. So this is a uh, very, very useful, very, very uh, good guidelines um, coming in. So uh, I must also mention a thank you to QMAC um, for you know sharing the guide um, for how we can do the SLT. So thank you so much for that. Okay. Now, um, again, from Dr. Leela, if it's a weekly participation in e-forum from weeks four to seven, of five marks each requiring about five fifty minutes. Um, that that I think possibly is a for me at least. I think that's a reasonable time. I might give a bit more marks if it's up to twenty minutes, but it's still reasonable um, if you give five marks for something that is just you know something that's not too burdensome in, in terms of time that the student has to allocate to do that assessment. Okay, now we have another question on um, can the final summative assessment be in the form of group work? Okay, thank you so much for asking this question. I actually forgot to mention just now about group work. Um, I will need, uh, with regards to summative assessment in the form of group work, I am not able to answer this question um, right now. Is there anyone from QMEC that might be able to help uh, to answer this question? Okay, perhaps uh, not right sorry, now. Dr. Tamira. Dr. Tamira, sorry. Apa soalan tadi? Okay, so soalan tadi. Uh, thank you so much, Professor, for being here. Can, so final, the can final summative assessment be in the form of group work? Boleh, tak ada masalah. Uh, even 
assignment in a form of group work. As long as it fulfills the CLO, we have no problem with that. Hmm. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Dia tak ada apa-apa masalah. Uh, it depends on the lecturers. As long as everyone got the CLO, uh, the rubrics must be uh, really reflect what the work yang dilakukan oleh pelajar lah. At the end, the lecturer must make sure that all students get uh, the outcomes. That's what the most important thing that we uh, need to look at. Okay, Doctor. Okay, thank you so much, Puan Farhana. So that's Puan Farhana from QMAC. Thanks so much for answering that question. Uh, I'm really glad that we got to this question, by the way, because I forgot to mention something about group work. Um, the thing about group work is that sometimes we need it um, because, you know, we need to have students actually, maybe the CLO, um, or we want them to have the skill of working in groups. And sometimes we as lecturers need to do group work for the assessment because we have maybe, you know, class with many, many students. But one of the complaints that students have had about group work um, is that it's difficult to do during on online teaching. And, uh, it's difficult to do group work. Some students complain that it's difficult to do it uh, via online teaching and learning. And some students uh, also complain that group work leads to some of their members actually being freeloaders and not everybody giving um, the same commitment and contribution. So uh, just a, a sort of uh, maybe suggestion for group work is that if we assign group work to students, it's very, very important that we take the responsibility as lecturers to actually guide or inform the students about the roles and responsibilities of every person in the group. So we can have the group actually decide among themselves what their roles and responsibilities are, but we can and maybe to have them accountable for it maybe have the group um, submit to us what each person's role and responsibility that they have agreed upon. And that's one way to ensure fairness in the group. Another way is that we can actually have and tell them from the very beginning that they will be assessing one another via peer assessment where perhaps we can have um, small marks or maybe no marks but a form where each person can assess all of their group mates and submit to us. Um, so this will ensure that everybody will contribute to the group and because they know that their peers are going to be assessing them and that we as the lecturer are going to know what their peers are saying, um, whether or not you know they're contributing um, or they're committed to the group. So that's one thing with regards to fairness. Now the other thing about group work during online, um, you know, during this sort of like online uh, learning period, um, some students, um, for some students, you know, they, they, they find it difficult, especially if the group work requires them to actually create or come up with a product. Uh, if it's, say, a writing assignment, a writing kind of like project or a uh, project, a group project where we need the students to create some kind of um, a media project, a video or an infographic, what we can do, again, is to uh, firstly give very specific instructions on what they need to do as a group. We can also help them to work together to team. We can help them in the teaming process where we guide them through a group meeting online. So we can actually do this by encouraging them. Uh, you know, I think students are quite well versed with actually uh, discussing things on WhatsApp groups. Um, we can help be in the group um, initially to sort of like uh, help them with their initial teaming or their in initial grouping so that they can figure out how they can work together and they can ask us questions at the same time. And we can also uh, get our students to maybe um, get into breakout groups. So we can organize breakout groups on MS Teams or we can get the students to, and encourage them to do their own sort of like um, uh, group video calls so that they actually have the sense that they are in a group and not just, you know, doing work um, on their own. So that teaming is quite quite important for group work. Okay, so I just want to share a little bit about group uh, assessment there. So let me go continue on uh, a little bit more. Okay. Um, 
okay just looking for more questions if there are any so we have another one here what do you recommend for final assessment submission okay i have 180 students last time we used spectrum for submission half claimed they submitted on spectrum but it was lost i asked them to submit to my email asap Within 15 minutes, there were 80 student emails with attachments. <laughs> I got a heart attack straight away. Yeah, 80 emails with attachments. I would get a heart attack too. <laughs> well, okay, um, what we can definitely do is uh, Let's do assess um, submissions on what, what I have done in my, my practice is I have actually given students um, a main submission platform and an alternative backup submission platform and also a special submission um, arrangement for students who tell me in advance that they have problems with the main and the backup submission platform. So the main submission platform ideally uh, would be Spectrum. At the same time, uh, we can also have students uh, submit uh, via Microsoft Teams. There's also ways for students to up upload their assignments in Microsoft Teams. Uh, another way which many lecturers are using, if you don't have students in China, this would be uh, something that you can consider, is to give students a Google Drive link. You can create a Google Drive folder and then uh, make it an open folder that students can uh, submit to and you can actually ask students to upload their assignments right into the Google Drive um, folder and this actually I found to be very very useful and easy because everything is in there it's easy for me to read it's easy for me to go back um, and and look at it uh, so yeah so those are what some of the things that you can possibly do if you have a lot of students and they might be submitting things um, at different times uh, one thing we might want to consider as well is um, when we have final assessments, um, if it's at the end uh, and students will be submitting things kind of like at one go, is that perhaps you might want to um, to tell students that there's, okay, for example, let's say that I have a final assessment is due um, in seven days. So perhaps on the 14th, uh, in, on the date of the final assessment, maybe I can actually tell students that, okay, students with this particular metric number from metric number one up to metric number, say, 50, submit um, between, try to submit between, um, you know, 8 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m. And as students with metric number 51 to 100 try to submit between 12 p.m. to uh, say 6 p.m. So you kind of like jarak um, So that's another possibility of doing it. But if you do decide to do that, um, you should only be doing that for assessments in which you have actually given students um, a very long uh, time period to complete the assessment so that it doesn't become unfair to students who have to submit a bit earlier on. So for example, if you give them say two days uh, or three days to submit, that would be okay. But if you give them 24 hours to submit, then maybe it wouldn't be fair to students um, because then some other students would get an extra 12 hours or an extra 24 hours simply because you've sort of like push their submission a little bit later. So um, those are just some some suggestions. Um, I'm sure others would, you know, probably be able to help as well if you talk to other people uh, on how they've actually handled that. Okay, so let me continue on. Okay, uh, just let me. This is not a question, but do allow me to read this out. Um, Dr. Sri Devi has, uh, Prof. Sri Devi has mentioned that um, in terms of allocating marks. Um, uh, if students prefer, um, okay, sorry, just let me read this, okay. I think the argument of faculty not to give too many tasks uh, with, you know, small marks uh, of five marks each, it's not so much of the allocation of marks. They prefer big chunks, 30, 30, 40, no more than three to four tasks, less is better. Okay, um, in terms of uh, record 
keeping and entering marks definitely um, the fewer number of assignments that you have to actually enter marks for the easier it is um, especially if you have more students um, that you're, you're dealing with but um, uh, let me just share my own what I had done uh, again it's just my personal my personal preference what I did with my students where I had given them um, 10 assessments worth five marks each and I only took the top five assessments uh, and recorded that as their marks. Uh, what I did was actually um, those marks that they, I actually, um, sorry, those 10 assessments in Maya, uh, I recorded it as one assessment that is worth 25 marks. But for my students, um, you know, outside of Maya, for my students, I actually uh, gave them, they actually know what marks that they got for each uh, of the 10 quizzes. And they, so therefore they also knew that I will be taking only the top five marks. So I actually did that manually in Excel. Um, and then when I had like, you know, compiled the top five marks from those 10 um, quizzes or 10 tasks. Um, I had like, you know, something over 25. So some, some students got 25, some students got 20 over 25, maybe some students got say 10 over uh, 15 over 25. So I only entered that into Maya. So it was just one. So in Maya, it was like a 25 mark thing. Uh, and I can, uh, so, so that's one way of doing it so that we don't have like smaller chunks and so many marks to enter, but we just have like one chunk, one big uh, mark to enter, but it's actually comprised of many smaller marks that I actually, um, that I actually record offline. Okay, so let me just go down a little bit more, see if there are any more questions. Okay, um, all right, so we have one question here. Is there any reason or justification why the teaching process needs to end in week 13? Uh, I'm not sure I can answer this question. I believe the whole teaching and learning can end in week 13 or week 14, um, but maybe perhaps somebody from QMAC, uh, Puan Farhana, would you be able to help answer this question? Okay, Dr. Amira, uh, regarding the question, actually for teaching and learning, everything must be done within the 14 weeks and um, based on the discussion this morning with NCA, Dr. Kiran informed that uh, we agreed that teaching and learning is done for the 14 weeks and the final assess summative assessment will be done during the three weeks after teaching and learning for the summative assessment. So that's why uh, for us in QMAC, we consider a semester as 17 weeks, actually. It's not 14 weeks. 14 weeks is for teaching and learning. Okay, so what at, whatever activity can be done within these 17 weeks for that semester. So uh, I'm not really sure why teaching should end in 13 weeks. Maybe that's the faculty stand on certain things. Uh, that one we give academic autonomy to the faculty to decide and on what is the best uh, teaching method that they want to implement. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Pun Farhana. So, um, yeah, it looks like we actually do have 14 weeks uh, in general, unless your faculty has a different ruling for teaching and learning. And we can do our final summative assessment after that 14 weeks. Uh, during the three weeks beyond the 14 weeks. Uh, but uh, for Hannah, we can actually also do the final summative assessment, say in week 13 or 14, if we have already covered um, all the CLOs. Am I correct? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, and the so assignments, <laughs> especially on the assign assignments, since we must give time for the lecturer to do the marking. If not, you won't get to uh, key in the marks on the allocated times. That's why we also give leeways to for the summative assessment to be done during the 13 week and 14 weeks. Okay. 
<laughs> okay, thank you, Puan Farhana. So, um, yeah, so there's quite a lot of flexibility. Uh, we have guidelines, but even if you look into the guidelines, um, it's actually quite flexible. They're actually meant to help both us with our preparations and our teaching and our marking and also our students in terms of their learning and um, their improvement during assessments. So um, I believe all of the questions in the chat have been covered now. And uh, I think I will be uh, ending this webinar now. Thank you so much to all of you who are still here. Thank you also to those of you who had to leave but are following this in the recording later on. And um, I hope that teaching will go well for you the next, we're starting next week. So all the best with that and um, take care everyone. Thank you so much again. Please don't forget by the way, to please fill up the feedback form for this particular webinar. Um, ADEC really, really needs uh, your feedback on that. That helps us to improve as well later. So thank you so much, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Bye.